Thank you for joining us so bright, so early um, this chilly Friday morning. Um, I want to thank yesterday's plenary panelists for setting a tone in this conference that is at once inviting and exacting. I think that balance is quite central to the kind of training that black women's studies does best. I went to bed last night thinking about Farah's loving remark, go back to class. Um, today we're going to go back to class. I look forward to a day full of papers and discussions about new research in the fields of African American women's history and black feminist theory, both of which continue to be influenced by the terms and questions set forth by Higginbotham in Righteous Discontent. And as Evelyn Higginbotham's discussion yesterday of Nanny Helen Burroughs suggested, the commitment that we have in this room that we share to describing our historical subjects what black women actually said, um, what they actually did. I was so moved by how much of Nanny Helen Burroughs' voice was in your speech yesterday, Evelyn, um, is what we're all about, you know, um, and, and to try to describe those words and those actions with nuance and with complexity. And so we will set about that work today. I also want to thank Professor Higginbotham for modeling last night and in general as a writer and as a teacher a mode of doing history that centers black women's voices and that is insistent on a politics of this is what she said. Um, and also an ethic of get it right. Um, when I was in graduate school, I handed Evelyn what I thought then was a done dissertation. And I was like, OK. You know that adage? A good dissertation is a finished dissertation. That is not Evelyn's adage. <laughs> she, <laughs> she looked at it and she said, nope. And at that moment, I was completely crushed. And, uh, and also, I think that moment was one of the most important gifts that she ever gave me as a teacher, this ethic of get it right. It's worth it to get it right. We have to get it right. Farah yesterday said that Evelyn's work and her teaching marked a shift in expectation about what it was possible to know and what we would be expected to know to call ourselves credible historians of black women's lives. So I'm excited to have a whole day to dwell together within the scholarly excellence and intellectual curiosity of this room. So with that, let me again thank Stephanie LaRue, Caitlin Murphy-Scott, Christina Downs, and Stacey Ferreira at the CSREA for keeping this whole idea afloat and for making today and yesterday happen. And of course, I'd like to thank Professor Tricia Rose, Professor of Africana Studies and Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. I'd also like to again thank our collaborators, the Departments of History, American and Ethnic Studies, Africana Studies in the Rights and Reason Theater, and the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. And finally, I want to highlight uh, that Brit Threat, a graduate student in Africana Studies here, um, may ask those of you who are presenting at this, pan, at, at this uh, conference um, for a brief, like, five-minute interview um, on video for a new series that the CSREA is calling the Spotlight Series, um, which will highlight this conference. So just be aware of that. And thank you to Brit and Julian for handling that part of the conference. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Professor Kevin Kwashi. Um, and he will lead us in our first panel of the day. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's appropriate to start with two rounds of thanks. One of them to Emily Owens for the work of putting this together, and the other one to Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham for that mighty book. And the way I'd like to say thank you is with two quick comments that I think would be a setup for the panel. One is to acknowledge that yesterday during the beautiful plenary, one of the uh, members on the stage reminded us of the title of that iconic black women's studies book, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave. And what I've always loved about that title is the way in which the people anchored to it 
didn't try to find another social location or identity as a name. Instead, it was the word brave, as if they were trying to recreate a habitat for what it meant to be human. And what I love about that is the way in which it reminds us that black women's studies all along has been theoretically and philosophically involved in rethinking what we know, how we know what we know, how we understand what it is to be human. We could indeed call all of those women philosophers, as we could indeed call all of the people who were on the stage yesterday philosophers. The second thing I'd like to say that as a thank you is as much as we focus on the term politics of respectability, I would also like to focus on Professor Higginbotham's title, Righteous Discontent. That word righteous especially, as I've spent time with it this summer in some studying I've been doing, I'm reminded that the self-righteous person says, because I think this, I'm better than you. The righteous person says, this I believe and I will try to live by. The righteous orientation then is an ethical orientation. And to me, as much as the politics of respectability is, is an iconic and enduring phrase from your work, Professor Higginbotham, it is also your very subtle reminder that the people you were writing about were ethically oriented in a world that might not have been oriented ethically towards them. That's a legacy indeed. So can we please thank both Emily Owens and Professor Higginbotham. We do indeed have a lot of work to do. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite the panelists here. I will briefly introduce the panel by its title and introduce the panelists simply because their extended bios are included in the um, program that were handed to you. I want to be clear that that is no disregard to the incredible work that the thinkers who will join us this morning have done. Just so that we have a sense of how things will go, each of the panelists will speak for about 15 minutes, and then Farah Jasmine Griffin will respond for about 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up for question and answers. The panel is titled, Black Feminist Theory, Cultural Work, and Disrespectability. It will include Tanisha Ford, who teaches at University of Delaware, Shanika Roach, who teaches at Brandeis University, Faith Lois Smith, who also teaches at Brandeis University. And the discussant will be Farah Jasmine Griffin of Columbia University. So please help me welcome them to the front of the room. such an honor to be here, um, and I say that in, in, in the social media way, I'm humbled and honored to be here, but I'm also very excited to be here to, to celebrate this book, to think critically about righteous discontent, and so I want to thank Emily Owens for extending the invitation for me to be here, and also Trisha Rose and the staff of the CSREA for hosting this amazing event. Um, I'm hoping that my slides here work because I want to show a few images that I'm, I think will help enunciate some of the points that I want to make. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to really situate my comments within a certain moment, a moment in which I came to understand or was first introduced to the concept of the politics of respectability and Dr. Higginbotham's work. Here we go. Can you all see that image? Okay, so I'm a historian by training, and so I want us to, to begin by thinking about or remembering an event in the more recent past. In August 2015, a photograph of activist, public theologian, and founder of Urban Cusp, Rahil Tesfamariam, Rahil Tesfamariam went viral. On August 10th, Tesfamariam and other protesters marched through downtown St. Louis a year and a day after the murder of Ferguson, Missouri, Ferguson, Missouri resident Michael Brown was murdered. 
Tessa Miriam was arrested alongside 60 other faith leaders who had blocked the entrance of the St. Louis Federal Courthouse in an act of civil disobedience. As you can see here, she's wearing a shirt that reads, this ain't your mama's civil rights movement. If we look closely at this shirt, the sleeves are cut off, the bottom is cropped. You know how we do with a t-shirt. We take that thing and we make it our own something special, right? So she has this cropped off. And it should be noted, though, that um, perhaps in the previous picture you could see that underneath this shirt, she's wearing some kind of unitard or a tank top to cover her midriff if she raises her arms so that you can't see that sliver of skin, a gesture that some might consider respectable. Her shirt is faded and worn in. Her hair is in a messy ponytail. She's wearing denim jeans, no makeup. And those of us who were circulating in the social media sphere in this time remember that Rahel was very active on social media. And there were tons of images of her that kind of pepper the social media sphere. And we had never really seen her like this. She was usually very polished and very stylish. She wore um, makeup, had her hair styled, very much a femme performance, high femme performance. So to see her in this moment, I think, was part of what made this image go viral. And also because she's handcuffed, you can see the law enforcement officer behind her. And because of this shirt, this ain't your mama's civil rights movement. In a piece titled, Why the Modern Civil Rights Movement Keeps Religious Leaders at Arm's Length, which ran on the WashingtonPost.com on September 18th, 2015, Tessa Miriam writes, on my shirt was a quote from Hands Up United co-founder Tef Poe. This ain't your mama civil rights movement. The phrase has resonated with many young activists who reject the identity politics, conservative rules, and traditional tactics of the church-led movement of the 1960s. The front lines of the fight for civil rights are no longer manned by the traditional leaders of the black community, well-dressed, respectable clergymen. This is a movement that encourages all to come as you are, invoking that language is very familiar to us who grew up in the black church. Natural, bohemian, rebellious, tatted up, provocative, ratchet. Two months after the St. Louis protests, a month after Tess for Miriam's piece was published, writer and cultural critic Kimberly Foster publishes a dialogue with Dr. Higginbotham on her popular black feminist site, for Harriet, titled, Wrestling with Respectability in the Age of Black Lives Matter. I want to be sure to note here that Foster was an undergraduate student at Harvard University who had taken classes with Higginbotham. And while she didn't go on to earn a PhD, she was and remains highly invested in having rigorous and robust dialogue on feminist issues rooted in academic analysis. I encourage you all to go back to read or reread this piece and teach it. Because I think it's this moment where Kimberly Foster is urging people to understand that although we're invoking this language of respectability politics, that it comes from a larger concept or theory and a book that's really deep and richly research, research that tells this much broader story about black women's lives and their engagement in the public sphere and their fight for decency, for greater freedoms, and an end to racial segregation and greater rights for women. And so it was important that she named this piece Wrestling with Respectability because she wanted, she understood that there was this generational conversation that was taking place or cross-generational conversation that we needed to have about respectability. But in order to fully have that, con that conversation, we need to understand the text from which notions of respectability that activists were taking up and using and employing had come from. So today in my remaining minutes here, I want to think about not so much how this discussion of politics respect, of respectability has been adopted, flattened, and railed against by a new generation of activists and public thinkers, but instead to consider how many people of this generation were introduced to Higginbotham's theory. Rahel and I are roughly the same age, thus we entered college around the same time. And so I want us to think about the relationship for us between the politics of respectability or respectability politics and the sartorial, 
I want to highlight some of the images also that live in my black feminist archive and my digital space to kind of make sense of how some of these things come together. So one of the first things I want to show is from a course catalog, a digital course catalog. I attended Indiana University and I majored in English and African Diaspora Studies. And this was a time when most black feminist theory courses were taught in black studies departments. And I enrolled in this course, Black Feminist Perspectives, circa 2000, and it was taught by Dr. Audrey Todd McCluskey. And if you can read on this description, it says this course is part particularly concerned with how black women's lived experiences define that consciousness and the differing impact it has among various groups of black women and in their larger social, political, and cultural communities. Now, did any, was anybody else perhaps in college around the early 2000s? Anyone else, anyone else taking black feminist theory courses around that time? Well, if you were, and if you weren't, let me just be clear that you, there were certain theories that you were gonna know, right? They were gonna make sure you walked out of this class understanding certain concepts and theories that were really germane to understanding black feminist thought. And one of those theories was the politics of respectability. I remember Dr. McCluskey assigning the, that last chapter of Righteous Discontent. Uh, but we also studied the culture of dissemblance, and I remember that one being like, yeah, that seems like something I should really know. But as an undergrad, couldn't quite understand all of the, the pieces and nuances of it. But also controlling images. Um, you know, we, we walked away saying, oh, Mammy, Jezebel, Sapphire, we had this language. <laughs> Others I can remember from that time were Bell Hooks eating the other, Elsa Barkley Brown and her conversation about Gumbo Yaya, Fran Beals, Double Jeopardy. So by this point, for scholars and academics like my professor, these theories were well circulated and had an institutional life. But for we undergrads, we were coming to these things afresh and, and new, not really understanding debates in the field and historiography and those sorts of things. I also want to note that in this same class, Dr. McCluskey also assigned Joan Morgan's when chicken heads come home to roost. And we were introduced to the concept of hip hop feminism. And chicken heads wasn't part of this established black feminist syllabus. It was just published the year before in 1999. And that was the book that I purchased in hardback. Like many of you purchased Righteous Discontent in hardback. <laughs> right, so it's interesting how hardback versus paperback helps us to remember where, when and where we entered, right, into this black feminist space. <laughs> So again, I, I want to emphasize this point that as we're reading these texts, you know, think about, and I, now I'm empathizing with my undergraduates as I'm asking them to think through all these, you know, very complex ideas in my black feminist, I mean, black women's history course this semester, that these folks don't, they're not concerned with historiography. They don't really know, I'm trying to help them understand what an intervention is, right? They, they're, they're trying to understand disciplines and methods, and we were the same way. We didn't necessarily have all the understandings of, you know, what separated a journalist like Joan Morgan from a person trained in sociology or someone who had a PhD in history. But we were grabbing a hold of these ideas and concepts because they were helping us make sense of ourselves and our world. We had just lived through the so-called crack ep epidemic, the war on drugs, the LA riots, seeing Rodney King beating, the Rodney King beating loop on our televisions. And respectability and controlling images in particular became two theories that stuck with many of us in some shape or form as black girls who were just entering into adulthood. Because those theories in particular spoke to issues related to the body, self-presentation, dress and adornment, and the politics therein that we were navigating both on our campuses and in our communities back home. And we were grappling with these things as we were seeing these very regal looking, educated, well-styled, I mean, look at them, black women professors who were teaching these classes. You know, so even when I, I did this interview with um, Mark Anthony Neal, on the show Left of Black, and he's like, you know, your generation is styling out with clothes, and, and I said, oh, no, 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 
Have you seen uh, Professor Darlene Clark Hyde and her scarves? Okay, we got this from somewhere, right? And so we're watching these women, a lot of whom were really instrumental in bringing black feminists uh, black feminism into the black studies space and creating some of those original or early black studies programs and departments. So many of us took those fragments and shards of knowledge that we had gleaned and perhaps quasi remembered from those readings in our black feminist courses and on those syllabi and carried them into the world with us as we became K through 12 teachers, community organizers, lawyers, nurses, engineers, therapists, retail workers, and so forth. In short, these theories helped shape a generation of college women and became part of a syllabus that shaped the ideology of a generation of activists. So it's no wonder then that for me, my work has always centered um, the politics of dress and notions of respectability and the ways that black women across time have challenged respectability. And both of my books that I've published thus far, Liberated Threads and Dressed in Dreams, kind of take up these issues across time. These are some of the images that I grapple with. We have one of Dejeria Becton, the um, Texas teen who was uh, um, physically assaulted by a, a police officer after being um, just attending a pool party. One of the Grandassa models, uh, Cicola Brathwaite, Molly Moon, and Josephine Baker, who are central to a new book I'm working on. Clothing designed by South, Af South African fashion designer, Stone Cherry. Dory Ladner, dressed in her overalls, which for me helped to complicate this idea that this ain't your mama's civil rights movement. I'm saying, do you really know what your mama's civil rights movement looks like? Because as you can see, we have Joyce Ladner in her overalls, not that Sunday best attire that we see in the top photo. And her hair is closely shorn and natural. But this also means that this generation of activists, even with their interpretation or understanding of respectability politics and what it means, they too are coming from this generation of black feminists and black queer thinkers who came of age in a moment after Righteous Discontent was published. And they're thinking about how do we wear those politics on our body? If we're going to contest, if we're going to announce something different for ourselves, how do we show up? And so to me, it, it isn't shocking then that we see what we now call message t-shirts with hashtag Black Lives Matter, hashtag say her name, Lord University, that black power fist, Asada taught me another text that I think was very prominent on that black feminist syllabus that we took with us and made and remade and added to. Dear racism, I'm not my grandparents, sincerely these hands. Another t-shirt that I say, what? Did you know what your grandparents' hands looked like? I mean, because your grandparents was ready to throw down, too. And many of them were armed. <clears throat> Just saying. I love being a scholar of the civil rights era. But to, for me, again, it's this investment in the body and the politics of the body that I think we really glean from that scholarship, that it gives us a way to consider the sartorial in very serious ways, in nuanced ways, in robust ways. So this t-shirt, again, to go back to the image of Rahel in which I, I begin my remarks, was donated. She donated it to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2006. And so now it is a part of the material archive of the Black Lives Matter and larger movement for black lives. So I'll end there. Just something for us to ponder. everyone. I join everyone else in thanking our organizers and in paying tribute to Professor Higginbotham. Uh. 
So I read the questions put to our panel. How has respectability traveled beyond the field of black women's history to black women's studies and black feminist theory? To what extent does respectability remain an organizing framework for black feminist theory? What other organizing categories have black feminists mobilized to theorize survival and resistance? I read this as an invitation to dislodge, in particular, travel beyond with, with its from the implications that this could have an um, of an origin from which something then travels elsewhere, and to pursue some of the parallel situations in which respectability has been negotiated. In the novels I read and teach, a series of images make this vivid for me. Young women in Sitsi Dangaremba's nervous conditions contorting themselves in response to multiple sources of authority, um, in response to white Rhodesians, black male Rhodesians waiting to assume power in a future Zimbabwe and exerting patriarchal control over their families, mothers and aunts transforming their sense of being diminished and stifled into the repressive socialization of their daughters, or a journalist pro protesting his government's repressive policies, yet turning his household into a collection of broken limbs as he struggles to reconcile his Catholicism with his spiritual and performative traditions outside of the orbit of Christianity. And this is um, Adichie's purple hibiscus. These are both examples from Western and Southern Africa in the British imperial context. I could have chosen Angie Cruz's Soledad, which moves between Washington Heights, New York, and the Dominican Republic, or Jamaica Kincaid's Lucy moving between the British Caribbean and the US, and in which young women contend with histories of sexual shame that cloak them, the women in their communities, their territories, and of which they're often only dimly aware. They feel the burden of failing to live up to standards of respectability violently inculcated into their forebears. C.L.R. James, born at the cusp of the 20th century, describes his late, 20th, his late 19th century grandfather going to church in the Eastern Caribbean, and I'm quoting, every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, wearing in the broiling sun a frock coat, striped trousers, and top hat with his walking stick. Respectability was not an ideal, but it was an armor, close quote. This armor is part of the violent inculcation of a colonial declaration of savagery and an invitation slash command to convert it into a reformed manhood, to join the, the ranks of the human, in fact. And their descendants, young people such as the fictional ones I've just described, will feel the consequences of this, whether their forebears responded favorable to the invitation command or not. In different contexts across territories under the thumb of a European imperial power, sometimes succeeded by the US, particularly after the Spanish-American War, some with histories of enslavement, some not, these texts dramatize the violent psychic and bodily consequences of legal codes, of church doctrine, of educational curricula, all, all um, curtailing physical, economic, and political mobility, and the often traumatic process of contending, as Higginbotham's social actors did, with both external and internal factions. So external, um, British colonial authorities, US tourists newly empowered by the Spanish-American War to roam Caribbean streets with a camera, autocratic rulers inheriting power at the moment of political independence. And besides this external pressure to submit exercised by colonial authorities or the post-independent state, there's the internal pressure, the members of a more immediate community, the members of the household, and the relentless um, um, uh, pressure of this internal source is conveyed memorably when in one of Jamaica Kincaid's vignettes we hear the constant refrain of a mother berating her daughter as the slut you are so bent on becoming, the slut you are so bent on becoming. Higginbotham's emphasis on the public, um, the black church and its public dimensions, its role as a social space for discussion of public concerns is useful, as is her movement between outward and inward directed critiques, as she invites us to consider how people are negotiating power in various contexts of subordination, colonial, in spirit if not in name, wielding epithets of shame against family and community as they try to dodge such epithets directly at them in the external realm. 
in cautioning against reductive critiques of the actions of the woman in her study as mindless mimicry of whiteness or accommodationist or compensatory. These are terms that she uses. Higginbotham's analysis is in conversation with scholars who urge that in the Anglophone Caribbean context, Englishness is best understood as partly constitutive of, rather than merely external to, discourses of blackness or Caribbeanness, even when these explicitly oppose Englishness. And here I'm thinking of the work of Belinda Edmondson, who's Making Men, 1999, maps out the way that a generation of Caribbean male writers fashion themselves in relation to models of intellectual authority offered by the Victorian um, writer as Victorian gentleman as writer and traveler in ways that both lived up to and critiqued the moral scaffolding of British rule. And Edmondson sketches out the ways in which these writers transform this into intellectual capital as exiles when they traveled abroad, while their female counterparts, uh, uh, the women writers, um, Caribbean women writers, were, um, were only able to, to transform this as, as migrant laborers abroad. What did it mean then to negotiate domination in these various contexts? In Higginbotham's text, we can think of African Americans in a key period of the institutionalization of Jim Crow in the context of a US state flush with the anxiety and success of the Spanish-American War with implications for the Caribbean and the Pacific, an increasing interest in the African continent. And remember that this follows decades of consolidation of the internal colonization of First Nation communities and of Mexican territories. In the Caribbean, the late 19th and early 20th centuries were marked by an increasing sense of the US's material presence, the military occupations of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the purchase of the Danish Virgin Islands, the Jones Act of, of Puerto Rico, the, the machinations of the United Fruit Company. And this was continuous with older European colonial regimes. What are the consequences of this exercise of successive regimes of power? As a European imperial power, exam, ex, exam, for example, Britain enforced respectability as if in its own image and as a way of covering over its own violence. As the US followed suit, what were the consequences for the ruled as they experienced the exercise of power and as this experience of power came to shape their relationships with their communities? M. Jackie Alexander has outlined the relationship between colonialism and the anxiety of these Caribbean men, the descendants of the enslaved and the indentured, who were nationalist leaders in the pre-independence period and political leaders later on. And her work focuses on Trinidad and Tobago and the Bahamas. She says, quote, colonial rules simultaneously involved racializing and sexualizing the population, which also meant naturalizing whiteness, close quote. Respectability, black masculinity, and nationalism, Alexander argues, are shaped by what she calls naturalized heterosexuality. And key for her here are the implications for sexuality as a response to the colonial charge of inherent savagery entailed a distancing from those deemed non-respectable in order to demonstrate moral rectitude. Linking respectability to a sort of payment of debt for being rescued from savagery, she notes that after independence, quote, black masculinity continues the policing of sexualized bodies as if the colonial masters were still looking on, as if to convey legitimate claims to being civilized, close quote. And Alexander ultimately goes on to suggest that legislation of the 80s and early 90s that criminalized non-heteronormative behavior, even while relying on women's sexual labor for tourism, was part of a compensatory surveillance of the sexual. Punitive laws in the um, early 1990s, late 1980s, whereby new sexual offenses legislation criminalized sex between women for the, for the first time, constituted an attempt to exercise moral authority in the face of the shrinking ability of Caribbean states to exercise political and economic power as World Bank and IMF agreements eroded these governments' ability to fulfill promises made at the moment of independence in the 1960s, the moral health of the nation, vulnerable to global currents of supposed sexual deviance, became increasingly important. And some of this legislation was tacked on to codes that criminalized marital rape for the first time, legislation fought for 
by the region's feminists. Thus, Alexander wonders how feminists end up aiding state surveillance and criminalization of women, and if, quote, feminist political struggles can have any radical potential if they remain enmeshed in heteronormative conceptions of citizenship. Another place to look for the interplay of respectability and the practice of power is in the phalanx of anthropologists who trained their attention on the sexual lives of working class women in the Caribbean in the mid 19th century and who found what they understood to be, as Rhoda read at notes, um, quote, deviations from the norm of the conjugal family that signaled disorganized, dysfunctional, um, family relations centered around what was considered to be the disproportionate centrality of the mother and the relative absence of a dominant instrumental male. Such words as matrifocal, matrilocal, matrilineal, mother-centered, matricentric, and even denuded reflect, Reddock continues, assumptions about the specific deviant characteristics of this family system. And as we know in the US context, Horton Spillers examines in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, the rhetoric of the 1965 report on the Negro family, The Tangle of Pathology, authored by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and which charged black women in the US with inflicting on their communities a matriarchal structure which kept black family life far out of line with the rest of American society, meaning that the normative family was a patriarchal family. Thinking about respectability in the context of family life in the English-speaking Caribbean, also means taking into account the extent to which Afro-Caribbean women were compared unfavorable, unfavorably to Indo-Caribbean women. As indentured labor was imported into the Caribbean to keep wages low, thwarting the attempt by the newly freed in the post-abolition period to get higher wages, both constituencies were racialized by the colonial authorities in different and overlapping strategies of violence. The family the life of the one group, as we've just seen, with its inconsistent presence of the dominant instrumental male, to go back to Redux's phrase, was contrasted with the suitably patriarchal character of the other. And here it's worth pointing out that in other contexts, Indo-Caribbean people were deemed insufficiently respectable compared to colonial authorities and missionaries. So black women were loud, crude, promiscuous, in contradistinction to docile women and stable homes of Indo-Caribbean communities. And here I'm interested in Andil Gosin's con con concept of what he calls wrecking work to allude both to what was destroyed in the process of indentureship and colonialism and to what must be refused if respectability means investing in structures that prop up patriarchal and other hierarchies. And he posits naming and caste as inheritances that should be interrogated rather than ce celebrated without question. Today we're trying to understand these legacies of colonial and imperial violence that are often claimed as part of the natural fabric of Caribbean life, of our essential sovereign post-colonial present. Popular music, for instance, becomes a flashpoint for debates about authenticity, for notions of propriety, whether this propriety is being endorsed or ridiculed, about the extent to which national feeling extends beyond the geographical borders of the nation, and the conjoined pride and anxiety about the transnational character of the nation, as well as the global recognition of the nation as synonymous with its music. When these lyrics are, violently homo are virulently homophobic, as some are, global and particularly global North displeasure is framed as imperialist, as intrusive, as foreign, Part of a recognition that concerns about innate Caribbean homophobia can be continuous with understandings of Caribbean people as insufficiently modern, but also, of course, shutting down a conversation about what in fact constitutes or can be permitted to constitute complexly realized ways of framing what it means to be Caribbean. These discussions are both continuous with and properly understood in the context of generations of often violent punishment of the colonial and then post-colonial body for transgression of perceived moral norms, buttressed by, in Jamaica, for example, the 1864 Offenses Against the Person Act, still on the books, punishing with hard labor and imprisonment the abominable crime of buggery. This is Victorian era legislation that is both still on the books and fiercely defended in the present as essentially Jamaican.
My final example con concerns another law from the colonial period, this time British Guyana, today Guyana, the 1893 Summary Conviction of Offenses Ordinance, deeming it illegal for anyone being a man in any public way or, or public place for any improper purpose to appear in female attire, or being a woman in any public way or any public place for any improper purpose to appear in male attire. As Diana Payton has explained, this was part of low-level magistrate enforced or police enforced law outside of the scope of judge and jury and enacted after abolition to target those most likely to be without access to private space. On February 6, 2009, seven persons were arrested in Georgetown, Guyana under this 1893 act for being what the law deemed to be men and for appearing in what the law uh, and for appearing in female attire in public and for immoral purposes four Gulliver McEwen and Angel um, Clark Peaches Fraser and Isabella Prasad appealed uh, at, they lost the uh, the, ninth, the 20 they lost the 2010 appeal but they took it to the Caribbean Court of Justice in 2018 um, and in November last year, this law was struck down as invalid. Um, four trans women then, over eight years of insisting on their right to self-identification, tested our investment in gender and are continuing dance with what our panel chair has just described as the habitat for what it means to be human. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Does this work? Can you hear me? Okay. I want to read from here, if that's okay. I didn't have a chance to print out my paper, and I'll feel more grounded looking at the computer screen here. So I'd like to start by thanking the symposium organizers, the amazing Emily Owens, Trisha Rose, Stephanie LaRue, and the virtuosic staff at CSREA for the generous invitation to participate in this deeply important conversation. I would especially like to thank Professor Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, whose groundbreaking and important work occasions this conference and continues to generate so much space for black women's studies and black feminist theory. So I'm currently writing my first book, tentatively titled Black Dwelling, which examines the political and erotic utility of domesticity as both an idea and material space in the black feminist imagination. And when I was finalizing archival research for this project, I revisited Anne Petrie's 1946 novel, The Street, and I was taken by the protagonist, Ludie Johnson's unmitigated desire for her own home space. I was also fascinated by the ways in which her positionality as a young, working, poor, black female domestic in an elite white household nurtured her musings on domestic spaces as sites that materialize an understanding of how the social regulation of black bodies, particularly black female bodies, structures the environments to, to which black women do and do not have access and the material conditions that mediate that access. So I did my due diligence and reached into the Black Literary Studies archive to make sure that nobody said what I had planned to say about the text. <laughs> And I was surprised to find that, with the exception of Farrah Jasmine Griffin's amazing work, many critics position Ludie Johnson as a protagonist who uncritically adheres to domestic ideology, which was often conflated in the archive with the politics of respectability. This happened so often, I found it difficult to excavate the text from the ruins of this discourse. But I thought it important to return to righteous discontent to sit in the politics of respectability and to interrogate its connection, if any, to domestic ideology. And that is what I talk about in my talk here today, how revisiting Higginbotham and putting the politics of respectability into conversation with domestic ideologies reinvigorated my understanding of the politics of respectability as a black feminist spatial project one crucial to the development of a black feminist erotic politic that begins and ends in the home space. This reading contradicts the overrepresentation of the politics of respectability in contemporary black feminist theory and queer studies, 
as an anti-erotic politic that polices black gender and sex, black gender and sexual diversity. In the first few pages of Anne Petrie's 1946 novel, The Street, we encounter young, pensive, beautiful, working poor black single mother, Ludie Johnson, searching for an affordable apartment in 1940s Harlem after her marriage has turned sour and rooming in her dad's boarding house has lost its appeal. The novel immediately places Ludy on the ominous 116th Street. The street and the homes that dwell on it are personified as living, breathing entities that materialize white supremacist socio-spatial control of black bodies and myriad forms of anti-black regulation. The street is structured by rattled garbage cans, sucked window shades, busy pedestrians, floating debris, and tall huddled buildings that both envelope and contain the wind that teases the back of Ludy's neck while thrusting her toward the crumbling tenement building she will fatefully come to inhabit. The text chronicles Ludy's futile attempts to locate black home spaces using literary and performative techniques from narrative attention to geography, architectural aesthetics, interior design, and acts of homemaking to exemplify the structural and quotidian workings of anti-blackness as an intimate, everyday, and routinized process of discursive and material displacement. The street itself clutches the body of a thin, starved, nameless black boy whose corpse announces the crushing poverty, lack of economic opportunity, and white vigilantism facing black Harlemites. The idle black men who decorate the street that overworked black women trudge up after a long day of labor betrays the racialized gendered segregation of the early 20th century Northeastern workforce, specifically the Jim Crow policies that locked many black men out of the paid wage labor force while pressing black women into grueling, sexually exploitative domestic service positions in white households. Ludi herself mobilizes specific metaphors of domestic interiority, interiority, I'm sorry. To chart the impossibility of the black heteronormative household, for example, she blames the downfall of her marriage on the white enamel kitchen in Connecticut where she worked as a domestic. When she separates from her husband, it is her living decor and material possessions, a scarred bedroom set, a radio, a Congolian rug, a battered studio couch, an easy chair, and her son, Bub, that index her uphill battle to some semblance of erotic freedom which for Ludi would be most fully exemplified by a safe, bright home space for Bub, wherein he would wake up in a bedroom of his own with maple furniture, a bedspread and draperies with chips and boats on them, and plenty of windows and a room that looked out over a park. While the street is a rich and textured example of the ubiquity and political utility of domesticity within the black feminist imagination, much of the black feminist criticism surrounding the text with Jasmine, Fair Jasmine Griffin's work serving as an exception, frames it as an example of yet another poor black woman's naive, naive adherence to domestic ideology or the politics of respectability. Kimberly Drake, for example, dismisses Ludi altogether, opting to instead engage the novel's minor characters who, quote, eschew domestic ideology and therefore survive and even flourish, while protagonists such as Ludi suffer. Evie Shockley argues that Ludi's story is calculated to demonstrate the incoherence of domesticity's norms as concerns a black woman of severely limited means living in a racially segregated America. Still others, such as Candace Jenkins, suggest that Ludi's motives are guided by an embrace of bourgeois propriety, which coupled with Ludi's decision to move into the apartment on 116th Street, quote, makes Ludi's unwitting contribution to her own victimization quite clear, unquote. In these black feminist formulations, domestic ideology and the politics of respectability operate as twin signifiers, a kind of black feminist theoretical shorthand that always already signals black women's bad object choices and presumptively anti-erotic performances of the black female body. I dwell on this archival example from my own research, the novel itself and the criticism around it, because it mirrors the ahistoric uptake of the politics of respectability in the contemporary black feminist and queer studies imagination. Black feminists from Brittany Cooper to Joan Morgan have constructed the politics of respectability as a political parable for the presumptive dangers and allegedly denied pleasures inherent in both quiet performances of the black body and in black dwelling spaces such as the church and home. This conception of the politics of respectability limits our understanding of the historical and historiographic roots of the politics of respectability and forecloses the possibility of understanding the political and erotic work 
black Baptist women performed to carve out fresh discursive and material spaces for black women. Such conceptions of respectability also undermine the extent to which Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham envisioned the politics of respectability as a spatial project, one as complicated and potentially liberatory as the spaces that currently preoccupy the black feminist imagination, from the interior to the quiet, from the spaceship to the hold. In what follows then, I briefly engage Higginbotham's work to reframe the politics of respectability as a black feminist spatial project one invested in crafting alternative discursive material spaces for black women. Reframing the politics of respectability this way opens space for a more specific understanding of domesticity as it metaphorically and theoretically operates in the street specifically and within the black feminist imagination more generally. In Righteous Discontent, Higginbotham develops the politics of respectability as a historiographic term to make sense of the ways in which early 20th century black Baptist women crafted a, borrowing language here, public performance of respectable behavior, which they felt, quote, would earn their people a measure of esteem from white America, unquote. Higginbotham explains that conservative black Baptist women attempted to enlist the black lower class's psychological allegiance to temperance, industriousness, thrift, refined manners, and Victorian sexual morals as part of an effort to, quote, forge a community that would command whites respect. She acknowledges the class tensions this created among black people themselves and names that black Baptist women never conceded that rejection of white middle class values by poor blacks afforded survival strategies, in fact, spaces of resistance, albeit different from their own. Here, I want to dwell on Higginbotham's discursive work on the relationship between the politics of respectability and the racialization of space on her notion of respectability as a public performance to craft an esteemed place for black women in a hostile white America, on respectability as a public performed a project that sometimes created tensions within some working class black folk, with some working class black folk who adopted their own strategies and forged their own spaces of resistance. Higginbotham's work on space here challenges much of what we presume to know about the politics of respectability and troubles the black feminist shorthand of respectability as an anti-erotic politic. For what she carefully outlines with her engagement with space here is black Baptist women's creative deployments of the black female body to cultivate a fresh discursive space for black women in white America. Since black women's forced migration to the Western world, our bodies have been legally and socially constructed as differently gendered, to borrow language from Hart, Saitia Hartman, sexualized sites of public property and the ongoing history of white America's sexual violence against black women is longer and more fluid than the litany of names that dance across Wharton Spiller's Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe. In the aftermath of slavery and during the Jim Crow era, black women who recognized the continued sexual viability of black women challenged the extant discourse on black womanhood as sexualized public property by using their own designed and rehearsed bodies to reimagine the black female body as a discursive and material space worthy of public self-esteem or public esteem. These embodied performances enabled the cultivation of other spaces such as the church, which black feminist theory and theology has begun to newly theorize as an erotic space, one in which black women could work on and through existing discourse to feel and feel good. In this way, the politics of respectability functions as a deeply erotic spatial project, one that prioritized the safety and preservation of black bodies in public which was crucial to the development of a private pleasure ethic in other spaces such as the church and home. At the same time, Higginbotham did not imagine this as a utopian politic. She acknowledged the fraught tensions between middle class black Baptist and working class black women who mobilized different strategies and constructed different spaces. Higginbotham herself constructs the politics of respectability as the complicated, racialized class gendered site of meaning and space making a site in and on through which black women struggled to create community and material spaces that felt good. When the politics of respectability serves as a shorthand for anti-eroticism in the contemporary black feminist theoretical project then, it limits our ability to define and mine the creative archives of black women's history and black feminist theory for the labor black women performed, often with their very bodies, to protect and preserve black embodied and otherwise material spaces. It also inhibits our ability to clarify our definitions of the political, the erotic, and sexual freedom. Rather than moving beyond respectability then, I propose that we dwell on it. 
What happens when we dwell on the politics of respectability? What might that yield? Dwelling on the criticism around the street is too respectable enables an understanding of the connections and discontinuities between domestic ideology and the politics of respectability, both of which get conflated in the criticism around the street. So dwelling for me here means that I must mark domestic ideology and the politics of respectability as two different historiographical terms that feminist historians Barbara Welter and Evelyn Higginbotham respectively developed to chart white and black women's differential processes of racialized gendered formation and resistance to subjugation in the 19th and 20th centuries. Dwelling on the politics of respectability as a spatial project opens space for my own theorization of the racialization of domesticity, the ways in which conceptions of domesticity, including welters, have relied on the productive, reproductive, and sexual labor of black women. This is in part why black feminists such as Ludie Johnson, if I can call her in in that way, have historically been invested in constructing and politicizing black domesticity, both discursively and materially, as sacred spaces for privacy, pleasure, counterplanning, and reprieve. Theorizations of domesticity as a site of erotic possibility abound in the black feminist imagination, which few scholars have paid attention to, given misinterpretations of the politics of respectability and the conflation of the politics of respectability with domesticity. This is also due in part to the predominance of other spatial metaphors in the black studies and queer studies imagination. Spatial metaphors such as the, such as the slave ship and the closet in the queer studies theoretical archive. Dwelling in respectability enlarges our understanding of domesticity as a generative portal into the black feminist imagination, which continues to laboriously demonstrate the ways in which our home spaces materially reflect discursive and material inequalities and offer radical designs for living under different terms and conditions. In my own book project, I dwell on the street because it is a rich and textured example of the ubiquity of domesticity and home within the black feminist imagination. It evinces how domesticity's critical and aesthetic manifest manifestation in black feminist and creative, black feminist critical and creative production serves not as an example of black women's problematic adherence to a cult of true womanhood, domestic ideology, and or a politics of respectability, frameworks which themselves need to be pulled apart, contextualized, and reframed if we are to treat them in their respective context and practitioners with integrity and specificity, but rather I respatialize domesticity as a crucial technology of black dispossession and as a site of black erotic possibility. The street's engagement with domesticity reflects a long if quiet tradition within black feminism that continues to challenge the denigration of the black home as apolitical, chaotic, unruly, and pathological, and that theorizes the black home as a paradigmatic site and idiom of black erotic freedom. It reminds me of Harriet Jacobs' articulation of home ownership as a measure of her freedom, of Audre Lorde's insistence that we cannot source our liberation tools from the master's house, of Hortense Spiller's positioning of the slave ship as an alternative site for black domesticity, of Angela Davis's framing of the slave quarters as black women's private rehearsal spaces for black resistance, of Bell Hooks's notion of home place as a site of resistance, of Claudia Tate's tropological formulation of domesticity as a political signifier. Thus, if we reframe the street among other critical and cultural productions within this black feminist lineage, we might apprehend domesticity and the politics of respectability as black feminist aesthetics and theoretics from and through which to craft radical designs for living in a white America structured by the prohibition of black respite, privacy, self-containment, and reprieve. Thank all of you for those um, brilliant and imaginative and generative papers. Um, I'm going to try to do the impossible here. I know I, I, I study jazz improvisation. I'm, I don't practice improvisation. <laughs> I try to do it <laughs> here um, on the fly. So um, as the title of um, this panel suggests, um, Black Feminist Theory, Cultural Work, and Disrespectability. Uh, these papers take on the politics of respectability as a launching pad to explore 
instances both where people have challenged what they read as the policing behaviors um, in the name of respectability, but also to expand our understanding of the possibilities of that theoretical, um, the theoretical possibilities of that framing. Professor Ford, um, there are just key, um, key phrases in each of the papers that really stood out to me. Professor Ford um, used the phrase fragments and shards of knowledge and um, reminding us that how these black feminist theories helped to shape a generation of college women, including those who would emerge as um, on the forefront not only of the scholarly work of the next generation of black feminist scholars, but also um, of, you know, in the work of the activists as well, um, that these fragments and shards of knowledge informed both theory and activism, um, and that things like the historiography, things that those of us gathered in this room are most concerned with, um, often were not uh, what followed in the wake of those um, projects. I think that her paper is also an important reminder that every generation does, and I would say must, distinguish itself from previous generations, even as it owes an obligation to the work that those generations did. And so that taking as a launching pad the politics of respectability um, and choosing to go in another direction, looking at figures and peoples and, and behaviors that might not adhere to um, practices of respectability has actually opened up, and I don't think we should deny this, opened up a whole new realm of scholarly study, right? Um, that would not, in, in, in interesting ways, even though it emerges in opposition to, um, would not exist without theorizing of the politics of respectability. So I'm gonna thank Professor Ford for reminding us of that. Um, Professor Smith uh, talked about the outward and inward techniques of practicing respectability and showed us the ways that respectability and its legacies um, impact, take hold, are practiced and critiqued by writers and intellectuals not only in the United States but also in the Caribbean and West Africa and how um, many of the more contemporary writers are responding to uh, legacies of an older generation uh, whose practice of respectability was in and of itself um, a resistant politic, right? Even as it became um, sort of policing in ways that uh, are, well, in ways that sort of reiterate, um, respect, re reiterate respectability as a ways, way of imposing normative heterosexuality and patholo pathologies of black family structures. Um, she reminds us, I think importantly, that that historical moment uh, that uh, Professor Higginbotham writes about, which is the moment of the emergence of Jim Crow and the ways that um, black women Baptist activists were responding to Jim Crow, is also the moment that um, America is coming out of the Spanish-American Civil War and imposing on its own project of imperial expansion. Uh, and so I, I thought, um, how interesting it would be to have projects that looked at the ways that both communities impacted by these politics responded, um, how they mobilized politics of respectability and how respectability, um, as Professor Smith reminds us, was also used to cover up the violence of those imperialist regimes as well. And then she ends with the reminder that contemporary trans women continue within the tradition of, show, of, of black feminism in terms of showing us um, what it means to be human, how we know and what we know about what it means to be human. And then Professor Roach uh, actually gives, you know, as someone who's read the street a million times and has tried to keep up on all the scholarship about the street, um, you always think, okay, I, there's nothing else to be said about this novel. Like the person yesterday said, there's nothing else to say, be said about black women. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, this paper shows that that is a, a, a text that's um, still awaiting new kinds of critical um, examinations. Um, and she uses the street kind of as a launching pad to talk about the ways that contemporary black feminist criticism has often misread, in her understanding, misread um, that text as a critique of Ludi's 
adhering to a politics of respect, respectability and as in doing such contributing to her own demise um, and says that um, this is a kind of ahistoric uptake of the politics of responsibility, calling our attention to the spatial politics of that text as well as of the women who first practiced this politics of respectability in the context of African American history, um, encouraging us to, and here she, I think, um, alludes to uh, Professor Kwashi's beautiful work where she talks about from the interior to the quiet, right? Um, and reminds us of Evelyn's own statement that uh, about respectability, politics of respectability being a public performance of respectability. And those two words are so important, public and performance, right? That, um, which prioritizes the safety of black women in the body, body politic. Um, she ends by saying that we don't have to move beyond respectability but remain with it and uses that phrase that just really stuck with me, dwell. I mean, and I, I love dwell because it means linger, stay, um, just kind of hang out in, right? Um, but it also suggests dwelling, right? Like the space of dwelling, right? Um, a space is where we live. To enlarge our understanding of domesticity, to look for radical designs for dwelling spaces that are filled with possibility. Um, that domesticity does not have to mean um, a kind of cult of domesticity, but instead the creation of a site of erotic possibility. And I think that it also um, dwell is what we are doing here, right? That to dwell doesn't mean a kind of hagi although I do, I think Evelyn deserves hagiography, but uh, not a hagiographic, you know, um, just sort of, uh, discussion of the politics of respectability, but to dwell in the context and the contours and the things that we disagree with and what's possible when we do disagree. So I thank, I thank all of them for getting us off to this great start and turn it over.